I'm just wondering, uh, we, we've heard of the, the trial judge's suggestion of a pretrial conference. As a, as a matter of practice, do defense counsel ever get together and discuss whether perhaps rather than having eight people cross-examine um, witness that aren't in contest, perhaps wiretap monitoring people or surveillance people, rather than have eight people cross-examine that witness, that one defense counsel will have carriage of that witness. Any additional questions that are necessary can be asked by other counsel. But instead of repeating it and perhaps taking eight times as long, a strategy be worked out in advance to consign different areas to different counsel. Well, I think I disagree with uh, one counsel taking the one witness. Uh, that does happen rarely, uh, where, but what you can do and what has been done, and I think Mr. Bynum, Mr. Humphrey, Mr. O'Connor and I did this on one trial, we decided which parts each one would specialize in. Now, we'd each have particular questions of the witness that were particular to our own client. But the important and the strategic part, the technical part, one would take. For example, uh, I think I did the biggest part of the research and the cross-examination of Dr. Forder on a case. This was by agreement of all counsel. Then there wasn't repetition of it. But I don't think you can say one counsel is going to take one witness to the exclusion of the others because he may want to get out the important facts, but you may have certain other things that are mundane to your defense that wouldn't be mundane to the defense of the client represented by the one lawyer. But in the, in the case that you're referring to, the three of you got together and did, in fact, define areas and attempt to, That's to right. get it. I assume you didn't lay, uh, uh, allow Dave uh, to talk about the law at all. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mr. Justice Galligan did most of that talk. Well, actually, Heather, in the dredging case, I think we hit probably the high water mark. And it. Uh, <laughs> he's, there been, he's been harboring that one for a long time. At the outset, an agreement between the Crown and Council while everyone was still talking to everybody, uh, I don't think they ever would have got through it. Uh, firstly, I think you have to be flexible uh, at, with respect to the order, but if you lay down the ground rules at the start, and it's extremely important that you do so. For example, just the hours of sitting. They're going to say, we're going to sit and that's it, and including the days off, and they're going to sit three out of four weeks a month or whatever it is, so that people know in advance and they can order their lives, including the jury. And with respect to the examination of witnesses. I think we uh, agreed that any, as defense counsel agreed, they could examine or cross-examine in any particular order as they chose. And amongst defense counsel, uh, there was an agreement that whatever witness the Crown called, uh, the person whose client was affected primarily or most directly by that witness examined or cross-examined first and then the others followed down the line. And of course, one of the cardinal rules was you don't ask any questions about anybody else's participation unless it has some bearing in, uh, directly to your defense. And accordingly, I think that saved a great deal of time until Julian Porter got up and we see he's down here and decided to change the rules, but we got them switched back. The uh, other parts of it, I think it's extremely important for example, to have accommodation when you have a big trial. Christ, you can't carry three or four or five bags in and out of court every day. Uh, and you run into problems here in Toronto of getting uh, uh, a room. Certainly the Crown has one, or five or ten of them have one room. But there's no way that you can carry five or six bags if you've got uh, 65 Page, uh, 65 volumes of evidence each day to move it in and out of the courtroom and that sort of thing. So accommodation is extremely important. The question of being able to try and continue on your practice while you're in one of these things is just phenomenal. Uh, you have clients coming in, you say, I'm sorry, I can't take your case for four months. Well, I'll wait around four months, so you set the case four months off, much to the chagrin of the, of the trial judges and the other courts. And then, of course, uh, about uh, three months along, you find out that your four month isn't going to be too far, and then you start off again, and you're winding up either giving your clients away or putting them off so that they're being tried two or three years down the road. 
You find that over time you start to meet resistance in other courts where you've got other trial dates set and uh, the conspiracy trial seems to continue. Well, I somewhere. don't act for the Crown, so the answer to that question is obvious. You care to expand on it? <laughs> of course you do, and there's nothing you can do. So what happens when you have a client that's been waiting six months for you? Then all of a sudden you say, well, geez, uh, the judge said he was going to have his uh, judgment ready and he needs two weeks. So you set uh, the case for the third week, uh, you take another week off, uh, you set it for the third week, and the judge takes six weeks to uh, prepare his charge. What the hell happens then? And all these cases have been hanging around for a year or two, and you set them to proceed at that time. It's, you have fantastic problems that you don't really anticipate until you get into these things. And you, uh, not only that, it's very hard when you have to give the money back. Before we leave the long trial, Heather, could I just make the comment that I think counsel have to realize that they're the people basically in charge often of the length of trial, Crown Counsel and Defense Counsel. And the hallmark of good counsel from the Crown's point of view is always that they will come to you and try to get agreement on as many areas as possible in order to cut down the length of trial. And I wonder if the reason that that comes so often with a good counsel is that they're the people whose clients are having to pay and they realize that their duty to the client is not to stretch this thing out and make the Crown prove every little bit of document and scientific evidence and every uh, go through every hoop on the wiretap, hoping that somebody will stumble and falls going through, knowing they probably won't, but that you've taken up weeks and weeks in the meantime. I think often that the good counsel, their client is the person who's actually paying them to be there on a daily basis. They realize that they're not discharging much of a duty to him to be running up this horrendous bill. That if they go to the Crown ahead of time and cut down as much as possible on the length of the trial, and it does disturb me when I see a fairly major charge laid and counsel comes in and it's obvious that there's a legal aid certificate behind it. And he starts talking in how many weeks it's going to take to have a preliminary that I thought would take a day and a half. And I just don't know where this wheat business is coming from. But, and I get a distinct impression that there's a real attempt to drag this thing out as far as possible. So I think to some extent you're being very unfair to the Crown to dump on them over the lengthy trials. These lengthy trials have come about in the era of legal aid far more than they did before. And I realize obviously dredging is, is, a, is, not, is the exception to that. But many of your, your uh, trials that go into several weeks or several months, uh, if you take a long, hard look at what you're taking that time up on, you could cut a lot of that down and save your client a lot of time and trouble and still do a good job for him and give him as good a defense as you would otherwise give him. Do you think even if a long conspiracy trial is basically funded by legal aid and virtually most, if not all, the clients are on legal aid, is it the sort of remuneration that's going to prompt the defense counsel to become independently wealthy? Well, unfortunately, I think uh, with the size of the bar today, nobody's going to be independently wealthy who graduated in the last five years. But that at least if you're in court and the meter's running, it beats being in the office where the meter isn't running. Do you have any comment to make to that, Mr. Brennan? Of course, the other side of the fence is, I suppose, that uh, when they had no legal aid, I know that the cases were a lot shorter because you had to fight like hell to get your disbursements. But on the other hand, uh, you always sit and wonder when you're under the gun and under that type of pressure uh, with no remuneration coming in, are you shortcutting it merely for your own benefit so that you personally are not uh, going to suffer too great a loss? Now, on the other side of the fence is, I suppose we get pet <coughs> complaints from, legal, uh, from judges and from crowns that uh, legal aid is clogging up the courts and uh, that the legal aid lawyers don't know what the hell they're doing. They're dragging out the cases. But when you take a look at the results, and you see an overall picture of the results of, uh, of the trials where they are being defended by legally aided uh, counsel. It seems to me that you have to strike a balance. Whether they're being paid or whether they're not going to be paid, you have bad counsel 
and you have good counsel, and I just don't think you can heap it on to legal aid. I think they're a hell of a lot better having a lawyer there than having none. If it's agreed that the evidence is long and complex and a legal charge on conspiracy uh, trial is a particularly difficult one to deliver and that the judge's charge may have great impact anyway, I'm just wondering whether um, there's some reason why we don't see an increase in judge alone conspiracies. Different areas of the law where it's complex or sophisticated already proceed by way of judge alone trial. Is it the sort of thing where we should be moving more and more into the area of judge alone trials? I'm not accustomed to defending innocent clients. I don't know. <laughs> I think you'd have to have pretty uh, a great amount of confidence in your judge. You'd have to know who your judge is. You'd have to assess uh, the judge's idiosyncrasies, if you can believe it. Some of them do have them out uh, there. And I think you'd have to make a recommendation to your client that uh, you feel he would receive a, a fair and good trial in front of that judge. And that his chances of success, bearing in mind the nature of the case, is as good in front of the judge as in front of a jury. And yet in a conspiracy, you would have to, you would have to convince uh, every one of your co-counsel to go along with it. Yes, that's if you decided to go with the judge. I personally hang in with the jury on most occasions. <laughs> You see, in the conspiracy, you still have a shot at the end of the Crown's case if you have a good conscientious judge that he'll take a look at it and say that there's just not enough direct evidence of participation by your particular client and get out uh, at that stage too. So you have a double shot. Do you find that there is a greater tendency to, to proceed by way of trials uh, by judge alone in your jurisdiction? I do. I, um, generally, I, I think that outside Toronto, we don't seem to just jump into the jury trial as quickly as they do in Toronto. I think one of the reasons would be that in Toronto, it, you, you spin the wheel and you take your chances as who the judge is going to be. And um, I think defense a few years ago, the one, no names, no pact, there's one judge in particular that you'd die if you got him. And I think that that happens. And um, whereas in the smaller areas, you know within one or two people who the judge will be, so that you're more likely to be prepared to take that uh, to take him because you know him and uh, have confidence in him. Do you find that the same situation is true in in? in There's a tremendous difference between practicing in Metro Toronto and practicing outside. Yeah, you don't have Jack Hughes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. No, I, I, I think that you're finding, for a large part, outside of Metro, there is a moving away from the jury trial and going to trial with judge alone. I think there's another thing you're seeing more of, too. You're seeing more people electing to be tried by their provincial court judges. I think a great deal uh, of change has come about there. I think the caliber of our provincial court judges uh, is to the extent now that uh, none of us hesitate to go before them. Certainly that would serve to, to expedite not only the, the trial, but minimize the expense to your client and the... And I found also with the Crowns that if you indicate you're going to elect a uh, provincial court judge, you get much fuller disclosure than you might otherwise get. Perhaps then we could move on, unless there are other issues that relate to the long trial and the breadth of practical experience that you gentlemen have, we could move on to the question of the evidentiary issues, the fourth and final consideration. Are there any special principles of evidence that apply only to a conspiracy charge, or is it basically exactly the same evidence that's admissible on substantive counts? There's just more of it. There's more of it. It's a garbage. They stand up and throw everything they can and undertake to uh, hook it up at the end of it, and uh, and you sit there and listen. Of course, uh, there isn't really that much difference if they chose to employ those tactics with respect to the substantive offense, bearing in mind the Kuflis and that line of cases. But it just seems that it's a very um, in thing to do these days to have a little conspiracy trial. So 
off you go. Only the Mounties used to use that, but they're spreading out now. So. Uh, I think that uh, uh, this again goes back to the area of whether the Crown or bears on that area we previously discussed whether the Crown should go with the substantive or the preliminary uh, or, or, the, uh, or the conspiracy charge. Uh, I think uh, that what might induce the Crown to do it besides the uh, these uh, evidentiary issues is uh, if we examine the differences between a laying a charge of conspiracy and say an attempt where you don't have the uh, substantive act completed and as you know in a conspiracy uh, you uh, it's uh, you require an agreement with an objective, and it has to go beyond intent. Uh, it has to be an agreement uh, to, in fact, achieve. But you don't have to achieve. And unlike attempt, uh, there need be no acts in furtherance going beyond mere, mere preparation. So it's an easier count to get someone on from the Crown's point of view, then uh, uh, charging the attempted substantive offense. Uh, again, it uh, differs from laying the substantive offense and uh, charging uh, the lesser figure with as a principal, but under Section 21 and aiding and abetting because in a conspiracy uh, you can get these uh, uh, small actors on the fringes in much more easily. Uh, in aiding and abetting, uh, on the other hand, uh, the Crown could use that. No agreement is required, but however, knowledge is required in some form of assistance. And often uh, the Crown ought to be doing that and can get the fringe player just as easily by charging him as a principal and, uh, and uh, on the uh, theory that he's guilty under aiding and abetting. And then don't forget, uh, uh, Clive has just mentioned, that hybrid type of offense uh, uh, that stems from uh, parod parody in the king and Kufus and has just been re-enunciated in the Mani Moda, and uh, that is that uh, even charging someone with the substantive offense, uh, if uh, you, uh, you're required, of course, to prove that at least one of the accused committed the substantive offense, well then, you can get the other one under 21-2, aiding and abetting, and you can, you can bring in all of this uh, evidence that ordinarily applies only to conspiracy trials, and, and in particular the acts and declarations of one accused being uh, evidence against the others, if you can get them under 21-2 because you have evidence of pre-concert. And uh, those uh, similarities and differences, I think, have to be remembered. And so when you get a conspiracy charge, then you've, the Crown can get in all those things that on a substantive offense, otherwise you couldn't. The acts and declarations of one done or said in, uh, in pursuit of the, uh, of the ob object or admissible against all the others. There's, all this evidence of association, uh, dear God, if you were ever seen with him. I think Mr. Reisman would remember from our trial, one of the accused was once seen meeting at the airport six years prior to the conspiracy with John Papalia, and that was sought to be brought in, and I thought that that was perhaps uh, a bit removed from the events. Uh, and uh, then, uh, you know, the business of the unnamed co-conspirators. And uh, 
the, this is the whole rat's nest that we're dealing with. What about the unindicted co-conspirator who just happens to show up in the witness box? Right. And, and not only that, it can get as complex as we had in our trial. We had unindicted co-conspirators, uh, unnamed co-conspirators, and then someone who didn't quite fit that category, uh, but uh, fit uh, the uh, category of accomplice, and then into the charge had to come in the evidence of the accomplice, <coughs> as distinguished from a conspirator, and, uh, and the usual bit that has to go into the charge on an accomplice. Put all that to a jury after uh, a six or seven month trial and have them sort that out. Well, if we're in agreement, then, that basically the same uh, principles of, of evidence apply and the same evidence will be admissible, it's just that there'll be vastly more of it because of the time frame of the conspiracy and probably a lot of added association evidence and surveillance evidence. What problems does that have in terms of practical application when you go to charge the jury with the different criteria that have to be met on evidence directly admissible against each conspirator before acts and furtherance of others can be considered? Do you think any jury is really seriously capable of understanding even the most carefully worded charge? No, uh, as, matter of, as a matter of fact, I have, I have completely rewritten my charge. Thank God I haven't had to give one uh, since uh, uh, the Workman case and, uh, and the Mota case. Uh, but I don't know how a jury can possibly understand that they are first to take an overview of all the evidence and apply the test of a balance of probabilities that more than likely a conspiracy has been proved, then take each accused separately and apply to him only the evidence that was directly led to his part and again apply the test of probability, uh, balance of probabilities, and if on either of these they decide that the test hasn't been met, then A, on the conspiracy itself, that's the end of the matter, be on the on the individual uh, co-conspirator, he's out automatically. And then you tell them, however, if you are satisfied that more than likely there is a conspiracy and that the the each of the or at least two of the uh, co-conspirators uh, also more on the balance of probabilities test uh, have been proved to have joined the conspiracy, then you say to them, now all the other evidence becomes admissible against everyone else, and now you apply the test of beyond a reasonable doubt on both the conspiracy and on each conspirator. And in all of that is the evidence. Now, uh, and you char after a case like that, you can't charge for less than eight hours, and it may be two or three or four days. How they can comprehend and apply that is beyond me. Plus acts and declarations and furtherance of the common design. Well, how about, how about aids then to the jury? Do you think there's any part, at least any place for the kind of developments that have taken place in Regina and, and Bangor in the BC Court of Appeal where the Crown, during the course of the Crown's address, can give to the jury a chronology of the events to assist them in following the acts alleged by the Crown and the association evidence that, that uh, is simply outlined that has been forthcoming from the evidence? Well, I think we, we certainly did that in the dredging case, but it became a battle of the charts. <laughs> who had the better chart and who was a better drawer and how they amended the charts and you put uh, a little uh, screen over the front of one chart and uh, then someone gives a little contrary evidence so they put a little line up and say contrary to the evidence of so-and-so and he says this and he says that and uh, it, uh, I hope it helps but I'll tell you it's a 
a real problem. Once you get into it, uh, you have to, of course, prove the authenticity of the chart, et cetera, et cetera, and whether or not that type of evidence is given undue weight when it gets into the uh, jury room since it's in written form as opposed to viva voce evidence where they have to assess credibility, et cetera, and it's, uh, it's a real problem. Well, if we, if we agree that the, the charge may be extremely difficult for the jury to follow, I, I assume we're all in agreement, however, that we have to take every possible step to ensure a minimum of error in the charge. Your Honor, do you, do you find it's of assistant or assistance, or is it part of your, your practice to allow the um, counsel, both Crown and Defense, um, to review with you the evidence, for example, that would be potentially directly admissible against each of the co-conspirators so that you'll have some assistance in preparing your charge? Well, again, uh, um, after a discussion three years ago, uh, to which I have already referred, uh, those of us who had participated in these long trials were all of the view that there should be a pre-charge conference uh, and invite all of these matters uh, from counsel, and uh, this uh, would be done uh, in the courtroom, in the presence of the accused, and with a reporter, and uh, and uh, vet all these matters of evidence and the charge. And you can't force them to participate in it, but uh, I would uh, certainly invite them. Uh, as far as I am concerned, any error that can possibly be avoided by, by listening to counsel uh, in this manner, particularly after the immense investment of, by the individuals and the public in a trial like this uh, is all to everyone's good, including that of the judge in preparing his charge. What about, what about providing pre-seed theories of the Crown and defense by counsel in writing to the trial judge for his consideration? Well, you can ask for that. We've dis uh, but some counsel refuse to do that. They, don't, they may think of something else. They, I, I, I respect their opinion. If they want to give it to me in writing, I'd be delighted. But uh, I, I wouldn't force them. Uh, but I would expect uh, that if they gave me no input that uh, uh, afterwards, if there were uh, if objections to my charge, I wouldn't be too pleased to hear them. Any other comment from, from any members of the panel as to, to how to, to uh, during the course of either addresses or the judge's charge, anything that can assist in a particularly complex conspiracy trial or a long term? Any? I think perhaps with respect to the jury, it might be wise at the outset if you could remand them 30 days for a mental examination. If you recall, you know, Your Honor, when we had the jury picked and uh, you know, partway into a trial and the juror brought way, a letter. It was the next day the, the, the juror brought a, a letter through the deputy to my attention. It was a, a letter from his doctor that he was a schizophrenic. He had no business <laughs> being in the damn trial. <laughs> There we were. Now, uh, how he got through the system to that point and got chosen, I don't know. I have no idea. And then, now you have 11. Well, the last now, suppose this great. happens in a, in a long conspiracy and this comes to your attention. Then the worries become more. And, uh, and uh, if you have one more with trouble, then everybody's just sitting on the edge. It's a dreadful thing. But there's something uh, uh, to what uh, Mr. Bino said about a, a, a juror uh, appearing out of his wits at the beginning of the trial. Uh, I reiterate what I said at the beginning, that something happens to everyone after four weeks in one of these trials. And uh, it... Uh, the requirement of patience and tolerance uh, becomes, uh, and good health, uh, becomes horrendous. And uh, uh, I, uh, I know that uh, in the long trial that I had, uh, I'm not a, 
ashamed to say this, uh, that uh, I thought I was doing awfully well. And then uh, after a particularly horrendous week at the end of the fourth month, I arrived home uh, and uh, sat down at the table and for no reason at all cried and I, I, the tears just came for half an hour. And uh, that's the sort of thing that happens to you. And uh, I don't think uh, any judge or any counsel uh, would want to get himself involved into a, in, in a uh, seven, eight, or 12 month trial like this more than once in his life. One, one, one last uh, question. Do you find, considering that these trials may go on for a number of months, how do you approach the jury address at the end of it or the, the, the um, Crown's address to the jury at the end of it uh, from the sea of notes that you must have taken during the course of the trial? Cautious. Okay. Okay. I, I, Mr. Bino's the one that's been in the one that went on for a year. Um, I've never been involved in anything like that, but any trial that goes on for any length of time, it's absolutely vital that you keep current with uh, your summary of the evidence and that your uh, address to the jury, you, you have to start preparing it virtually the first day of the trial so that you're not caught at the end. And if it's gone on for months, it, I, I would think that jury address, you're, you're preparing it constantly all the way through so that uh, it would be hopeless to try to do it in the last uh, two or three days. But, uh, Clive, what do you have to say about that? Well, I think that's substantially correct. You have to keep current on your way through, but I think you develop a, a line on the way through that your thread, what your defense is going to be, and you know what evidence is relevant, and you know what you want to stress, and you know what you want to minimize, and it seems to me that as you go along, you, you just make notes, and I keep a file usually. It says jury address, and if I think of anything, I just write it down, throw it in the file, and hopefully I date it so I know what it's in reference to. And uh, when you're uh, going to commence the uh, preparation in earnest of your jury address, you can look back at your files, and you get, a, get an overview of what your thinking was all the way through. And in addition to that, you have an insight as to how the evidence struck you at the time, not six months later when you're trying to reconstruct what happened in the matter. And I think that that's uh, very helpful. However, you know, every case is different. Uh, some of these longer cases, you can get away with a, an hour and a half uh, jury address or half an hour jury address. It depends on the, on the facts of the case. I know in a very recent case I was in the manslaughter matter, uh, the defense was, uh, Picayune in the sense that it just involved considerable detail with respect to evidence of circumstances that were given, and it just took a tremendous amount of time to cover all the points, but there was no way of shortcutting it. So uh, it's not necessarily the long case that necessitates the long jury address, but I think notes made at the time on the way through is a real key to it. Gentlemen, perhaps we could close with, with closing comments from each of you. Uh, based on your experience, is there any uh, advice or general observation you could make to, to the uh, members of the seminar who are attending that might be of assistance to them if they became involved in a longer trial? Starting with you, Mr. Gentleman. Well, my, my advice, I'll, I'll only presume to give advice to crowns, and that is that I, I think often the long and involved trial will go uh, to the detriment of the Crown, and I think you should look at the possibility of breaking it up into several smaller trials. I think in the long run that may well be to the advantage of the Crown. If you can isolate uh, your accused, isolate your issues, and um, uh, use a rifle as opposed to a shotgun, although I realize in certain circumstances if the ducks are flying too high and too fast, you're going to need the shotgun of conspiracy. Mr. Bino. I think it's a matter of uh, choosing your client. <laughs> Make the sure one, they have money. Get the one that's least involved and has the most money. <laughs> the, the real problem, I think, with the, the conspiracy cases is to be able to maintain your sense of balance and judgment. Remember that you're talking to the jury. They've only heard the thing once. 
right? You've been through, you've listened to your clients, you've been through a preliminary inquiry, you've listened to the evidence, you've prepared your cross-examination, just don't lose the thread of the case. Remember what the jury has to decide and hit those issues. I think that's really all I can tell you. Your Honor? Um, I think I pretty well touched on advice that I would give. Uh, I, uh, I, I would like to uh, thank Bill. I'm quite surprised he warned me that he was, that he was going to use this as uh, an opportunity to go at the judge. And uh, he's been very gentle. Uh, I'd like to answer the matter of, from a judge's point of view, of uh, judge uh, alone or jury. Uh, I uh, would much prefer, it's much easier, the trial is shorter, and I do, wouldn't have to give uh, a one or two or three day charge were I sitting alone. However, on the other hand, I strongly believe in the, on the criminal side in our jury system, and uh, I uh, find that uh, in charging juries, uh, a judge constantly has before him then the reminder of precisely all of the things that he should keep in mind when he is trying a jury alone. And the last comment I have, if I may, is that I think the system, the whole business of the long trial, and that's why I would so much like the, the, the procedural changes to allow the uh, pre-trial voir dires before we impanel a jury to come in, is that it is a horrendous uh, injustice to the middle class those uh, who do not qualify for legal aid and are not wealthy enough to carry on a trial for those for those long months. Mr. Mackey? Well, I think one of the important things is to do your work before you reach the preliminary stage. Try to narrow your issues, what manner you're going to approach the case, prepare your admissions, Warn your client of the difficulties of a long trial so that he doesn't walk in as a babe in the woods and get completely taken by surprise. Take the time to sit down with him and explain to him. You're not going to try to give him a lecture in law, but at least prepare him so that you've got a client who isn't shocked when he walked in. I think you should weigh heavily whether you want a judge alone or a judge and jury. You're going to be controlled to a great extent by your counsel for the co-accused. Uh, and hope and pray that you've got other counsel representing co-accused that you can work with and be ready to sit down and play fair and straight with him, if it's at all possible. Heather, may I say my one, one more word? It, it, I had intended to say this, and, and Bill's comments have just brought it to mind, and that is we've uh, forgotten, I, I forgot to mention about concern for accused persons who are in custody during this long trial. It can be horrendous to them, and that they have to be considered as well. Uh, for example, uh, in a long trial, and uh, the long one we had, we, we had uh, at least three of the accused in custody. They were being awakened at some ungodly hour of 5.30, and being brought to the courthouse, that was fine for about three weeks. After that, I noted that they were literally falling asleep uh, about uh, 11.30 or so. And uh, I discussed it with counsel, and we made arrangements. There was a, uh, a lot of fur flew over it, that these people be allowed to sleep in till 7 o'clock and be brought over later. It didn't matter if for one or two or three weeks, but over seven months, they were literally asleep during the trial. And fortunately, reason prevailed, and uh, they were allowed to do that. Are there any questions from the, from the audience or the panelists? Thank you. 
I'd like to be able to do that. I wish uh, we had agreement, and uh, we, because it's a long trial anyway, the judge has to work on his charge, and he keeps working on it for a long time. Uh, why not uh, have it uh, typed up and, uh, and given to the jury? I don't know how they can keep it all in mind and keep it all separated it in their minds, not, not only the evidence, uh, but the tremendously complicated law. Uh, it's a very good point. Uh, uh, it would perhaps require uh, procedural changes. Uh, I wouldn't be averse to it. I think it would be an aid to them. Sir? I think the first thing is get a list of your clients' assets. <laughs> I think Be really straight with them. Tell them that this is going to cost them. Tell them it's going to take a long time, that you can only estimate the time. Prepare them. Don't leave them in shock. Sir, I meant specifically with the practice that continues yeah. on. I, I think what you have to do is to make arrangements with someone who can cover for you. Uh, there's just no doubt that you can't carry on the day-to-day -day practice of law. It's very difficult even to refer uh, to return phone calls. You'll find out you're getting back to your office at 5.30 or a quarter to 6 and you try and return a phone call and not too many lawyers in the office at that time. Uh, it's tremendous. Uh, you also have problems with the staff. I mean, uh, if they're sitting there for six months, you're not any able to uh, give directions. It's it's extremely difficult. So I think you have to normally try and get some young practitioner uh, who has some time available, really, to take in and cover for you, and to whom your secretary can refer calls immediately and give prompt attention to it. That's one thing. The second thing, of course, is you must consider. Uh, that when you're through with a six or seven months trial or something like that, uh, what do you do right after it's over? I mean, it takes a little while to get the uh, clients to know that you're available. And uh, there's a hiatus uh, with respect to uh, what happens after the trial, and sometimes it has disastrous effect uh, on your uh, financial year, let alone the balance of your practice. So uh, it's, you have a lot of problems in it. You, I would say normally you have to think very carefully about whether you're going to get involved, and if you do, you have to take every precaution you can. Any other questions?